Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series of lessons has been a great one. I've really enjoyed studying the Book of Acts. This is the final lesson in that series entitled Journey to Rome. This is lesson number 13 in our series for September 29 of 2018. It's of course focuses on Acts 27 and 28 and you could guess what it talks about if you're familiar with scriptures. As usual we'd like to begin by asking God to guide us. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these revelations that were penned so long ago at such expense and such difficulty by Paul's friend Luke. We wish we had an ongoing history. What he would have said is an additional part of this book or maybe the second part of the book of Acts, which we don't have. But we thank you for what we do have and may our, our lives be enriched. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, almost everybody who studies scripture knows at least a little bit about that final journey of Paul to Rome. Wow. Was this Paul's first time to get in a shipwreck? No. 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 He spent 24 hours in the water in a previous shipwreck that he just mentions in, in passing in, in, in 2 Corinthians 11 or 12, somewhere in there. But this will cover that final journey to to Rome from Caesarea Maritima under the jurisdiction of Julius. Um, Paul had been wanting to make it to Rome for a long time, but I'm sure not under exactly these circumstances. Unfortunately, soon after arriving in Jerusalem, as we know, just to review our story, he yielded to the peer pressure from Jewish Christian believers and against God's will, he agreed to participate in that Jewish ceremony that resulted in his arrest, Acts of the Apostles, page 405. Repeatedly, the Jews tried in every way, and we studied this last week in our lesson, tried in every way they could think of to get Paul into their hands so they could kill him. They failed until Paul finally appealed to the emperor. As a Roman citizen, he had that right. While still a prisoner in Palestine, God had promised Paul that he would testify in Rome. Going back to Acts 23, verse 11, God said, that night the Lord stood by Paul and said, Don't be afraid. You have given your witness for me here in Jerusalem, and you must also do the same in Rome. Do you think that was an encouragement to Paul? Mm -hmm. He knew he would get there. He knew that he would get there. Very good. If we faithfully serve God, is that a guarantee that nothing bad will happen to us? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. Oh, boy famous people that we know about in the story of the Christian church and even before that have ended up as persecution and martyrdom. Can you name a few just offhand? Well, uh, James. James? Going back even before Stephen. that? They Stephen. tried to kill Peter a couple of times and John. Who else? Even what about John? They had tried to yeah. kill John the What Baptist. about John the Baptist? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And going back into the Old Testament, there's Still people Stephen. Yeah, Stephen, obvious, an obvious case. John the wow. Baptist. Yeah. Well, ultimately in Rome, Paul actually was able to testify to and convert some, quote, important figures in Caesar's household, Philippians 4.22. Do you think you could have done that? Now, we, we, try, we see things from Paul's perspective because it was Luke who was writing it and he's representing Paul, but what do we know about the Christian religion at that point in time? It was illegal. This was, the Roman government was trying to get rid of Christianity. And so what is Paul doing as a prisoner of Rome? Still, still preaching Christianity to anybody who would listen. You know, w would well, you no, dare? They, they would have heard it as, as Judaism because that's, yeah, that's possibly. kind of the context, you know, that this is simply the outworking of the Old Testament writers, and I still consider myself part of, of that. Yeah. With an additional message, however, because... Absolutely. Yeah, they were nonviolent. They were against uh, going to war, which the Romans abhorred. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, 
wanted uh, people willing to go fight for the em empire. Yeah. Well, based on the first person pronouns used in the last two chapters of Acts, it is almost certain that Luke, and he mentions Aristarchus, accompanied Paul while he was under the jurisdiction of the Roman centurion Julius on this journey. Do you think Tim Timothy might have been there as well? Possible. Quite possible. We hear him mentioned from time to time. The ancient boats were usually not that large. It's interesting if you have a chance to visit um, Ephesus at some point. Not very far from Ephesus are, t are two boats been reconstructed basically like boats in the days of Jesus and Paul. And one of them is pretty good size. But boy, 276 passengers would still be crowded. That's a, that's a big boat. Well, we also know that even today, there are terrible storms that sweep down out of Turkey, it would be today, across the Aegean Sea. I can tell you one time, uh, our, my son invited my wife and I to go with him to the Greek islands for a short vacation. And the airlines and the ships, we didn't even try to take an airline. We took a ship across from, basically from, um, was Corinth? No, it was, it was Athens. We took a ship from Athens to one of these islands and they just told us up front, if the weather turns bad, you're going to be stuck. We, we, it was late in October and so we knew about this in advance. So, I mean, this is not an unknown thing. Late October, March, things are really bad. Even today, severe weather is, is known. Well, the, the story picks up with the story of Paul's journey picks up in a place called Fair Havens. Where is Fair Havens? Crete. 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 It's in the southern, there's a, out, so a piece of land that sort of sticks out into the ocean, the southern part of, of Crete, and somewhere right there is, is Fair Havens. So um, what happened there at Fair Havens, Carrie? This comes from Acts 27, 9 to 12 in the Good News Translation. We spent a long time there until it became dangerous to continue the voyage. For by now the Day of Atonement was already past. So Paul gave them this advice, quote, Men, I see that our voyage from here on will be dangerous. There will be great damage to the cargo and to the ship and loss of life as well, unquote. But the army officer was convinced by what the captain and the owner of the ship said and not by what Paul said. The harbor was not a good one to spend the winter in, so most people were in favor of putting out to sea and trying to reach Phoenix, if possible, in order to spend the winter there. Phoenix is a harbor in Crete that faces southwest and northwest. So that would mean if the, if the big winds are coming from the east, north and east, if you were in a harbor that was facing west, you would be somewhat protected um, by things. Okay? Well, unfortunately, as we know from what follows, they were soon blown, they, they launched out into the ocean, soon blown far off course, and the terrible storms kept, came up. They were at serious risk of sinking and even of having the boat break apart. Things got so bad that, and I quote, they finally gave up all hope of being saved, Acts 27, 20, NIV. If Paul and his friends had not been on that ship, do you think it would have gone down? Probably. <laughs> it's very likely that Satan sent the storm and God preserved the lives. We went through a storm right in that area in 1952. Mm -hmm. And for three days, three after. nights, we did not move one inch yeah. from the maps. So we arrived in Marseille three days late, obviously. Yeah. But the captain on several occasions told us, you know, we are in grave danger. Anything could happen to us. Yep. Now, those storms can be very vicious in that exactly. area. Exactly. And the Mediterranean is known to have short waves, which makes it all the more treacherous for ships in, in that particular sea. Okay, 
And Fred, I think you have something. Oh, uh, yes, in Acts 27, 21 to 27, from the Good News Bible, we read, uh, after those on board had gone a long time without food, Paul stood before them and said, Men, you have listened to me, and yeah. you should have listened to me, and not sailed from Crete. Then we would have avoided all this damage and loss. But now I beg you, take heart. Not one of you will lose your life. Only the ship will be lost. For last night an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I worship, came to me and said, Don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand before the emperor. And God, in his goodness to you, has spared the lives of all those who are sailing with you. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for just a second. <laughs> There's our evidence that their lives are preserved because of God. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I felt the same way as a child on that ship. So, oh, my dad is a servant of God. I have nothing to worry about. <laughs> yeah, good. I'm glad you felt like that. <laughs> yeah, I did. But we will be driven ashore on some island. It was the 14th night, and we were being driven about the Mediterranean by the storm. About midnight, the sailors suspected that we were going to close to land. We're getting close that to we land. were getting close to land. Well, while it is possible that the entire ship was saved because of Paul's presence, which the, the verse seems to imply, it is also true that he tried to encourage those who were on the boat to do what they could to save themselves. Now, that has become uh, an issue in the past among Seventh-day Adventists working in hospitals and places around the world. Should we just pray for our patients and ask God to heal them, or should we do what we can to promote health as well as pray for them? And here's an example of someone says, you know, do, you, do what you can yourself and then pray to God. Um, God is planning to take us to a wonderful kingdom where there will be no troubles, no death, no crying, no disease, no pain. So why do we have to go through all these troubles now before we get there? Do we somehow need this to, to live in heaven? Builds character. <laughs> Builds character, okay. Is it really necessary for God's faithful people in the end of time to suffer under the tax of Satan, the beast, and the false prophet? Revelation 16 and 17. Well, with the fall, we have a world where there's the knowledge of good and evil. Evil came in, so um, either God abandon, abandons us to the evil or he seeks to draw us to him with the good and, and bring about salvation for us. He's trying to bring us out of this. He's not so much putting us into it as uh, stumbling blocks must come, but woe to you know, that verse. You know, th these things are going to happen mm -hmm. because you live in a world uh, that has evil. But uh, he will try to work through those things and bring about good for you, as it says in Romans. I try to imagine what it would be like in a bouncing, bobbing boat for two weeks. Nobody ate anything. I mean, is it because... They were all seasick, or? Yeah. <laughs> That's where I would be. <laughs> you know, in the old days, if you, you got seasick, you would rush over to the side of the ship and heave over the side. You know, they call that crossing the ocean by rail. <laughs> <laughs> A long time at the rail. <laughs> <laughs> long time at the rail. Well, so what did, the, what did the sailors do? They put out a weight and found out that it, the, the, the depth of the ocean is getting shallower and shallower, and they couldn't see where they were going. Of course, it was nighttime, and there's still a storm brewing. But it looked like they were getting closer to land. So what happened next, uh, Dennis? Acts 27, 30 to 44. Then the sailors tried to escape from the ship. They lowered the boat into the water and pretended um, the boat, uh, apparently a lifeboat, Mm -hmm. yeah. the boat into the water and pretended that they were going to put out some anchors from the front of the ship. But Paul said to the army officers and soldiers, if the sailors don't stay on board, you have no hope of being uh, saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the boat and let it go. Wow. 
Just before dawn, Paul begged them all to eat some food. You have been waiting for 14 days now, and all this time you have not eaten anything. I beg you then, eat some food you need it to order in order to survive. Not even a hair of your heads will be lost. After saying this, Paul took some bread, gave thanks to God before them all, broke it, and began to eat. They took heart, and every one of them also ate some food. There was a total of 276 of us on board. After everyone had eaten enough, they lightened the ship by throwing all the wheat into the sea. Okay, I'm going to interrupt there for just a second. How did Paul all of a sudden become the authority on the ship? He must have had a, an amazing presence about him. Well, because he had an the angel appeared to him somewhere. The captain like started believing him too, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and he had made predictions that came yeah. true. So yeah, how could yeah. you argue with that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Of course, uh, 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 anyway, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Dennis. The shipwreck. When day came, the sailors did not recognize the coast, but they noticed a bay with a beach and decided that, if possible, they would run the ship aground there. So they cut off the anchors and let them sink in the sea, and at the same time they untied the ropes that held the steering oars. Then they raised the sail at the front of the ship so that the wind would blow the ship forward and we headed for shore. Can I interrupt again for a second? I haven't heard any follow-up on this, but about a year ago now, um, th well, those anchors were probably made out of stone in those days. And about a year ago now, there was an archaeologist looking, exploring the southern uh, coast of Malta, thinks that he might have found those anchors. Mm. Mm -hmm. and one of these, you know, these marine archaeologists that are doing a lot of things now. Anyway, go ahead. But the ship hit a sandbank and went aground. The front part of the ship got stuck and could not move, while the back part was being broken to pieces by the violence of the waves. The soldiers made a plan to kill all the prisoners in order to keep them from swimming ashore and escaping. But the army officer wanted to save Paul, so he stopped them from doing this. Instead, he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and swim ashore. The rest were to follow, holding on to the planks or to some broken pieces of the ship. And this is how we all got safely ashore. Good and, news, Bible. And notice, notice the pronoun there? We. How we all got safely to shore. Mm -hmm. so, so how many prisoners do we have? There were 276 people Total together. on board, but, but I mean, there the must rest have been a good-sized group of prisoners. So maybe Paul wasn't the yeah, only I mean, one that I was mean, being taken to Rome. We, uh, the other rest of the people on that ship, I don't think they were on some kind of a pleasure cruise. Mm -mm. <laughs> I mean, you know, were there, were there a bunch of prisoners maybe? And yeah. who knows? Travelers, crew. Crew. People certainly. trying to get crew and people trying to get from Caesarea or, get, try, or Crete to, to Rome. So had these other prisoners appealed to Caesar also? or <laughs> We don't know. Good Did question. They start start with the Alexandrian ship back in Alexandria, or were they part of the, uh, what, those who got on, on at Caesarea, or, you know. Could be, could be, or even in Crete, potentially. Mm -hmm. But the phrase, kill all the prisoners, in first, that there had to be quite a few. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, 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 oh. exactly, yeah. And that seems like that may have been a standard Roman procedure, you know, if there's a possibility that a prisoner is going to escape, kill them, kill all of them. Great, great friendly kind of way to treat people. Well, if they had escaped, the people responsible for them, they would have I lost have their been. lives. Yes. Very possible. We know about Philippi. We know about the, the guards watching Peter and John back in Jerusalem. Now, Paul was a, a um, Roman citizen, though. Would that have prevented them from killing him outright, or? Um, Doesn't sound like it. No, and probably they were all Roman citizens, or they would have been killed before getting on that ship going to Rome. Uh, Quite possibly. Yeah, only Romans were to be tried in Rome. The others didn't yeah. have to go to such high levels of authority. Yeah. Well, it would be very interesting, maybe it will be someday if we see all the facts. Um, to see how that relationship developed between Paul and Julius, the Roman centurion. 
through those days of terror? Well, Paul had warned them before leaving Fairhaven that it would be a mistake to do so. But the ship's owner and captain thought they knew better. Early in the morning, as they approached that unknown coast, Paul urged the people on board to eat something. Why do you think they had not eaten anything for two weeks? Were they all seasick as a possibility? <laughs> Boy. Everyone was encouraged by the words of Paul and did, in fact, eat something. Wh what do you suppose they had to eat? Were they chewing on raw wheat or... I mean, well, that's what they. Well, they were transporting. Over. Yeah, they were that's what they were throwing over. overboard afterwards. So, well, probably according to typical pattern in dealing with Roman prisoners, the soldiers wanted to kill all the prisoners li lest they get free, but the centurion's relationship with Paul forbade them from doing that. Do you think the centurion believed that Paul and Paul's God were responsible for saving their lives? Mm -hmm. In other words, is this centurion starting to believe in Paul's God now? No doubt. Yeah. No doubt. I mean, you know. I sure like to think so. Yeah. No. And especially after what happens yeah. to come here. There's going to be even more dramatic things. Well, after arriving on shore, being very wet and cold, I'm sure, they learned they were in Malta. Where's Malta? Little Island. A little island out there, more or less in the middle of the Mediterranean. Mediterranean, yes. They so. had traveled about 475 miles across the Mediterranean from Crete. But the weather was clearly too bad to even think of going further, and, and the boat had been completely destroyed by that time. So, let's read Acts 28, 1-10 to here. When the, we were safely ashore, we learned that the island was called Malta. The natives there were very friendly to us. It had started to rain. It was cold, so they lit a fire and made us all welcome. And that time in the year, the temperature of the water would probably be around 50 degrees. Yeah. At least the air. Maybe, not the, maybe the water would be a little warmer. But it was, it was cold. Paul gathered up a bundle of sticks and was putting them on the fire when a snake came out on account of the heat and fastened itself to his hand. The natives saw the snake hanging on Paul's hand and said to one another, This man must be a murderer. But fate would not let him live, even though he escaped from the sea. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and without being harmed at all. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after waiting for a long time and not seeing anything unusual happening to him, they changed their minds and said, He's a god! <laughs> well, not far from that place were some fields that belonged to Publius the chief official of the island. He welcomed us kindly, and for three days we were his guests. Publius's father was in bed sick with fever and dysentery. Paul went into his room, prayed, placed his hands on him, and healed him. When this happened, all the other sick people on the island came and were healed. They gave us many gifts, and when we sailed, notice the pet pronouns again, they put on board with what we needed for, for, for the voyage. So who's talking there? Luke. 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 So we've already reviewed what it says there. When Paul did not suffer from any problems with that snake bite, they began to think that he must be a god. We do not know how the islanders of Malta managed to accommodate all those travelers. I think of our personal experience. We lived in northern Tanzania for a number of years, and it just happens that there's a lot of people coming and going in that part of the world. And my wife was a fabulous hostess. And we often would get unexpected visitors, quite a group. One night, late, and people usually don't travel on the roads in Tanzania at night. One night, we're, my parents were visiting us already. We already had my parents visiting us. And uh, we lived just a little ways outside of Arusha. And uh, we heard a knock on the door. We were really surprised because people don't, first of all, Tanzanians don't knock. They yell, Hody, outside. But someone was knocking on the door. We charged down. And lo and behold, here are two white men at, a, at the door. And we said, you know, what can we do? And they announced that they were missionaries from Rwanda and so forth. And they had come here and they were planning to go and climb Mount Kilimanjaro, which wasn't far away. We said, fine, well, come on in. You, so they asked us, where, isn't there a hotel we can stay at? No, oh, no, you don't want to go to any hotels. Come on in. Well, you can stay here. Well, he says, not quite that simple. There are 11 of us. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I think about that one. Uh, yeah. You know, what, what, what would you say? 
Mar Margaret, you're the only woman here tonight. You know, guess what? There's 50 households on the island or something like this, and we've got 276 people to accommodate. And they're going to be here for the winter. There's, there's a floor. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. And we have old meals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we don't know exactly who this Publius was, whether he was appointed by Rome, some kind of Roman official, or whether he was just a local chief. And then Paul, of course, healed him of this dysentery. Can you imagine how long it would take for a word to get around that there's someone in town who can heal anybody who's sick? Do you think Luke healed anybody? He was a doctor. What if we don't know? Yeah. Paul did the healing, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. You know, you think about that. Well, here, there's a doctor handy, but, oh, well, we've got a, we got a prophet and a man of God here. He'll take care of it. But we don't know whether Luke was like some of the other disciples that had, had the Holy Spirit on them and they were healing people. And yeah. Just because he was train doesn't preclude him from that happening, I wouldn't think. Yeah. Well, the result, of course, was that they were welcome everywhere on the island. And when they finally, in the spring, got ready to go, they had gifts heaped upon them. Luke didn't spend a lot of time talking about what had happened there. Paul was there. They were there for the winter. I mean, shouldn't Paul have established half a dozen churches over a winter? Well, we can be pretty sure that Paul took advantage of any opportunity he had after his clothes got dried out. <laughs> well, we do not know why Luke did not detail the results of Paul's visit to the island. Were there many converts to Christianity? We just don't know. Did Paul establish any churches there? We don't know. What we do know is that Paul met the needs of the local people where they were. You're sick? Come and see Paul and he'll take care of you. Well, finally, three months later, Paul and his companions found a place on a boat traveling from Alexandria in Egypt to Rome and proceeded on their journey. So what were these, bones, what were these boats doing coming from Alexandria to, to Rome? Trading. The, the other one had a lot of, of uh, wheat. Exactly. They were, the boats coming, there was a lot of food produced in, in Egypt that was being shipped to, to Rome. I'm sure that's largely what was included here. They spent three days in Syracuse, and then they went to Regium and finally reached Puteoli in the Bay of Naples, Acts 28, 11 to 16. They were already Christians there who begged Paul to stay with them for a week. Now, what does that tell you about the spread of the gospel? It is really spread. Mm -hmm. Amazing. You know, here's a relatively small town, quite a ways from Rome, and the gospel is already spread there. There's already Christians there. And remember, this is at a time when Christianity, and I keep saying this, but this is a time when Christianity was illegal. And yet it was spreading like wildfire. Well, finally they reached Rome. Believers from Rome had already heard that Paul was coming. They walked several miles out of Rome to the market of Epius and three inns to meet the weary travelers. As, it, as you can imagine, Paul was encouraged by this wonderful reception. And how, do we, how did Paul happen to know people in Rome? Well, he apparently had some, from Romans. Uh, he, Romans 15. He, yes, he uh, detailed a whole list of people. that Quite a long list. Still and Aquila were there when he wrote that letter, and he had some relatives there, apparently. And, other people he would have known who, who traveled to Rome from where we first met them. He even mentions relatives, uh, people who'd been co-workers, people who joined the churches in other places, and you know those were the days when quote all roads re all roads led to Rome. You know, so fortunately he had people there that he felt supported him and loved him. Well, look, look at Acts 25, 24 to 27. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are here with us, you see this man, um, see this man against whom all the Jewish people both here and in Jerusalem have brought complaints. You know what? I think that's a, an error in there. Yeah, oh, that's, that's the correct one. 
All the people here and in Jerusalem have brought complaints to me. They screamed that he should not live any longer, but I could not find that he had done anything for which he deserved the death sentence. And since he himself made an appeal to the emperor, I have decided to send him. But I have nothing definite about him to write to the emperor, so I brought him here before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after investigating his case, I may have something to write. So we know, although we don't have a copy of that report from Festus to Rome, this gives us a clue. He just didn't have much to say, right? Um, they had agreed. Felix agreed. Festus agreed. Agrippa agreed. There were no charges worthy of death. We do not know exactly what kind of letter Festus sent to Nero, but apparently it did not arouse any great suspicions with the Roman government. And the other question I would ask is, considering the kind of writing materials and so forth they had, how did it survive the swim from the boat to shore? Yeah. Did they arrive without a letter at all? And did, uh, if Luke wrote the book of Luke and uh, was writing, the, or maybe he wrote Acts of the Apostles later, or although you would think he would have been in, in the process, Yeah. How did all of that survive, too? Yeah. Well, apparently, Paul was allowed to rent a private dwelling where he was basically under house arrest, chained to a soldier, probably day and night. Well, look at Acts 28, verse 30. As soon as I can get my computer there. For two years, Paul lived in a place he rented for himself, and there he welcomed all who came to see him. He preached about the kingdom of God, taught about the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking with all boldness and freedom, period. And that's the end of the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. Does it look like something's missing? Mm -hmm. There's no final salutations. There's no bang. It's just it's done. Mm -hmm. It's as if uh, Luke disappeared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and or, yet we know he was in Rome later on, so yeah. he didn't. Or is it possible that he planned to write a third volume? Or... It, is it possible that it was written and lost? Yeah, written or even a few extra pages on this particular volume was lost. We just don't know. So how did Paul pay for his own private house? Probably the church members donated. They must have. That's very possible. What other possibilities? I mean, is it possible that Paul, while he's in chains, is, is making tents still? The Roman army needed a huge number of tents. You would have had to go to the marketplace to sell them, typically. Well, maybe Luke did that for him. Possibly. It would be kind of hard to do, change to some. You would have thought someone. so. Yeah. Well, try to imagine yourself as one of those soldiers who was chained to Paul. What do you think you would hear? Suppose they had eight-hour shifts. <laughs> Something like that. They certainly heard the gospel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so some of the ones who started becoming convinced about the, about the gospel, do you think they asked for extra shifts to take care of Paul? Maybe. Well, it would have been a, a very... Cushy kind wouldn't of be, it, it would have been cushy in the sense that this person is going to try to get away. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. he, he seems to be have a good nature and, and not cursing and swearing and complaining all the time. Yeah, he would have been a pleasant person to be yeah. around. He says something on verse uh, twenty-eight, chapter twenty-eight, that is mm -hmm. quite intriguing. Because uh, therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. And then there's a second version of that that says the Jews left. So were the Jews there arguing vigorously among themselves? Mm. Those are the two versions we have, and we don't know for sure if one has more authority than the other. So that's a note in the NIV. Yeah. Very good. Well, if you turn over to the end of the book of Philippians, and when was Philippians written? From Rome. At the end of Paul's imprisonment of Rome, just before he was released. And he said, all God's people here send greetings, especially those who belong to the emperor's palace. Mm -hmm. Wow. So obviously he converted some people. Mm -hmm. He convinced. Yeah. 
Yeah. But despite being a prisoner and potentially being called by Nero even to martyrdom at any moment, I mean, he could have been called at any moment to stand trial and potentially have his head cut off, Paul was still busy trying to spread the gospel. And we've got, um, I think, Margaret, I think that's yours. Yeah, Acts 28, 17 to 22. After three days, Paul called the local Jew Jewish leaders to a meeting. When they had gathered, he said to them, my fellow Israelites, even though I did nothing against our people or the customs that we received from our ancestors, I was made a prisoner in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. After questioning me, the Romans wanted to release me because they found that I had done nothing for which I deserved to die. Can I interrupt there for just a second? How did Paul know that? The references we have suggest that they said to themselves, there's nothing this man has done. Did they tell him, we don't know why you're in prison, you ought to be free? Probably. I mean, if they said that to him, why didn't Paul said, well, why don't you do it? I mean, wouldn't that be the logical thing to say? Mm -hmm. Well, in, in a one-on-one -on -one conversation maybe, but uh, he may have heard it. Um, from the you know the soldiers as they uh, took care of them and as you know they may have passed around amongst themselves overhearing what the uh, Herod and, and uh, Festus and others yeah said. I'm sure he probably heard it somehow or other yeah sorry Fred you no I was just going to say that Paul probably knew that he was being pursued and sooner or later Jews would find out where he is and they would take care of business. Yeah. Okay, Margaret, sorry. But when the Jews opposed this, I was forced to appeal to the emperor, even though I had no accusation to make against my own people. That is why I asked to see you and to talk with you. As a matter of fact, I am bound in chains like, chains like this for the sake of him for whom the people of Israel hope. They said to him, We have not received any letters from Ju Judea about you nor have any of our people come from there with any news or anything bad to say about you. But we would like to hear your ideas, because we know that everywhere people speak against this party to which you belong. And this is from the Good News Bible, Acts 28, 17 to 22. Okay, now I want you out there and our group here as well to think about this. How is it that they had heard nothing against Paul, but they had heard against Christianity. Well, there were Christians there in Rome. Yeah, but you would have thought with all the people in Paul, uh, who knew about Paul in Rome that they would have heard something about him, but obviously they didn't. Maybe the Christians kept quiet about it or they weren't talking to the Jews. Well, the Jews didn't make the journey to Rome <laughs> uh, either. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. what options did they have to send at this point? Because uh, by the time Paul left, it was already late in the season, and yeah. unless they outrun the Alexandrian ship and got there first. Yeah. Or, uh, oh, but he was, I mean, he was there in, Ro in prison in Rome. Of course, this was, yeah, this would be, this would be early spring, because he didn't wait any time. Well, Clearly, Paul could not go to the synagogue, but the synagogue could come to him. Mm -hmm. As usual, he tried to speak first to the Jewish people of Rome. Some of them were convinced and others were not. Nothing has changed, right? Paul was somewhat surprised that they had not received any information from Jerusalem about him. So a large group of Jews came to hear Paul. Um, and let's just look at that, Acts 28, 22. We would like to hear your ideas because we know that everywhere people are speaking against this party to which you belong. So they fixed a date with Paul, and a large number of them came that day to the place where Paul was staying. That's a nice way of putting it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> from, <laughs> from morning till night, he explained to them his message about the kingdom of God. And he tried to convince them, that, convince them about Jesus by quoting from the law of Moses and the writings of the prophets. Some of them were convinced by his words, but others would not believe. So he left. So they left, disagreeing among themselves. After Paul had said this one thing, how well the Holy Spirit spoke through the prophet Isaiah to your ancestors, where he said, 
Go and say to this people, you will listen and listen, but not understand. You will look and look, but not see, because this people's minds are dull, and they have stopped up their ears and closed their eyes. Otherwise, their ears would see, see uh, their eyes would see, their ears would hear, their minds would understand, and they would turn to me, says God, and I would heal them. And Paul concluded, you are to know then that God's message, message of salvation has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. What, um, how do you think that kind of message would be received? If you got that kind of a, you went to heard a sermon at church and uh, pastor says we brought a new message and here's what the new message is and you say well I'm not sure I believe that and so he ends up by condemning you that sound like a good way to go well what do you think Paul told him I'm sure he, he did his autobiography again he must, yeah. have, he must have done that as he'd done before and he apparently followed up with some powerful con arguments from the Old Testament, which they should have been very familiar with. But some were not convinced. It's interesting that Paul, however, there used the Greek translation, the Septuagint, instead of the Hebrew. Why do you think he did that? Because if you look at the Hebrew for those verses, it's a little different. Well, for one thing, the, the Hebrew text came much later. Mm -hmm. The Septuagint was the Bible of the time. For what reason? It that was the language. language. That was the language that people knew. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was the language that people knew. Yeah. There's, and you, if you get into the early Christian church history, you discover that for a while there was a huge argument almost a knockdown, drag out fight between the Jews and the Christians about who is going to have control of the Greek translation of the New Testament. I mean, of the, I'm sorry, not New Testament, of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. Because the Jews said, no, this is the history of our people. This book belongs to us. It should be translated and, and, and used and, and preached according to our ways, what, what we believe. And the Christians said, nothing doing. This is the first half of a two-volume thing, basically, the Old Testament and the New Testament, of, the, of, of God's people down through history, including us. And so they wanted the Old Testament to you know, respond to passages in the New Testament. And back and forth, they wanted these two to, to go together. And finally, the result was that, of course, the Christian, the number of Christians was just exploding. The number of Jews was, especially after Jerusalem and Judea were destroyed, was deteriorating. So it finally ended up that the Jews said, well, well, we'll just go back to our Hebrew. You people take the Greek, we'll go back to our Hebrew, we'll preserve the Hebrew, that will be, that will be the authentic Old Testament. And the Christians took over the Septuagint and, and translated it into in a Latin. classic. Yeah, mm -hmm. what? They translated it into Latin at first. Yeah, yeah pretty quickly. Um, a classic example of how they did that was quoting Isaiah 7:14 to match with the birth of Jesus. Behold, a virgin shall give rise to, a, will give birth, and so forth. Well, the, old, the, the Hebrew in the Old Testament says, doesn't say virgin, it says a young woman of marriageable age. But the, in the New Testament, it is a virgin. So they goes back and they translated the Old Testament to fit the New Testament. Well, of course, the Hebrews, the, the Jews, wouldn't be happy about that at all. Just That's just an example. Well, I'm sure Paul was really disappointed by everything that he saw and what these people did. Paul mentioned remained in Rome under house arrest for two years. Many people came to encourage him to hear his gospel message. Why do you think the book of Acts ends abruptly at this point? I mentioned that just briefly. Is it possible that some pages have been lost from all the copies that we have available to us? Is it possible that Luke intended to write a third book? We just don't know. Or did Luke feel that having reached Rome and having preached to a wide variety of people there, Paul's mission was accomplished? Is that, if you've, if you've gotten to Rome and you preach the message at Rome, is that you're finished with your job, right? Maybe. But Paul and, wanted to go to Spain. Yeah, he wanted to go to Spain. Um, and you know, a number of churches have taken up this theme and said, okay, 
it's our job to write the next chapters of the book of, of Acts. Is that, is that a fair cons consideration? It's a fair possibility. Maybe God left us on that precipice saying, okay, the ball's in your court. Jim, you have something there? Words from Acts of the Apostles 464 by Ellen White. She says, Paul's patience and cheerfulness during his long and unjust imprisonment, his courage and faith were a continual sermon. His spirit, so unlike the spirit of the world, bore witness that a power higher than that of earth was abiding with him. And by his example, Christians were impelled to greater energy <clears throat> as advocates of the cause from the public labors of which Paul had been withdrawn. In these ways were the apostles' bonds influential so that when his power and usefulness seemed cut off and in all appearance he could do the least, then it was that he gathered the sheaves for Christ in fields from which he seemed wholly excluded. Yeah. That's a little bit abstract in a way. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, who would have, who would, if Paul had gone to Rome, do you think he would have tried to witness to people from Nero's household? He wouldn't have access to them. Wouldn't have the opportunity, that's mm -hmm. right. Or so all the soldiers that took their turn guarding him. Exactly. And went out and spread the word about this guy. Exactly. So here he had, access to an audience he would probably not have had opportunity to speak to otherwise. The book of Acts is still not finished. It's mm. hard to add what we hope will be the final chapter to that book. And the other Jim? Christ has given to the church a sacred charge. Every member <laughs> should be a channel through which God could communicate to the world the treasures of his grace, the unsearchable riches of Christ. There is nothing that the Savior desires so much as agents who will represent to the world his spirit and his character. There is nothing that the world needs so much as the ma manifestation through humanity of the Savior's love. All heaven is waiting for men and women through whom God can reveal the power of Christianity. Ellen White, Acts of the wow. Apostles, page 600. And then, go ahead. Long has God awaited for the spirit of service to take possession of the whole church so that everyone should, shall be working for him according to his ability. When the members of the church of God do their appointed work in the needy fields at home and abroad, in, fulfill, in fulfillment of the gospel commission, the whole world will soon be warned and the Lord Jesus will return to this earth with power and great glory. That's also Acts of the Apostles, page 111. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. In the, in the days of the disciples, when on, on the weekend, crucifixion weekend, there were a few score. There were 11 disciples left and some few other people, you know, the brothers of Jesus and so forth, that were there. And we're told that within one generation, they had carried the gospel to the then known world. And how many, and how did they get around? What means of communication did they have? They walked. They walked. They walked. Yeah, took they walked. Boats. Took boats. boats or, or took boats or walked, yeah. basically. There was no internet. There was no TV. There was no radio. There was nothing written that they, well, they, they could write, but it was, it was way too expensive a way to communicate, except under very special circumstances. Obviously, Paul wrote letters, Luke wrote letters, but that wasn't a standard, you know, just knock off a letter and send it to somebody. So, now, do you think it was a bigger challenge for them to spread the gospel to, the, to their world, or a bigger challenge for us to spread the gospel when we can get on a computer, knock out a few words, push a button, and send it to the whole world? I think the well, population these days is much, much bigger than it was in their time. Oh yeah, we're, we're talking in their in their days. It was probably half a billion or something like that. Now we have seven billion. Yeah. Today it may be harder to get people's attention. I mean, just sending out a tweet or something, uh, post something on Facebook. Yes, there are 
billions of people out there, but mm -hmm. you're competing with billions of people <laughs> for attention. Whereas yeah. in the old days, when you're, you, you know, there was just the people around, and you would converse, and uh, and people were always anxious to hear, like these. Uh, Jewish, uh, these Jews in Rome, you know, they said, well, we've heard about this and we've heard some bad stuff, but we'd like to hear what you have to say. So, yeah. uh, there's, and then there's just mm -hmm. the, the, the media, just the TV and everything mm -hmm. is competing for attention. Remembering, of course, well, Fred, go ahead. You yeah, I was just going to say, um, in those days, there were pagans and there were Jews. Many pagans were converting to the Jewish religion because it made more sense. Yeah. And then comes Christianity that makes even more sense, especially the message of the apostles. So this message just caught on fire. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that within 300 years, the Franks had already been converted to Christianity and all the way to England, what is today England. It just spread throughout Europe with incredible yeah. speed. Yeah. It did. It certainly did. So there was hunger for something more logical with God. And what I'm afraid of is that modern Christianity may have pulled itself away from some of the logic of the apostles. Yes. Very much so. But remember, on the other side of the coin, Christianity all that time until the days of Constantine was a was an illegal religion. People were dying. Many and people. And after that too. <laughs> and afterwards, sure. Many people died defending Christianity in those days, or de died because they refused to offer an offering to in in the name of the emperor, to as as if he were a god. So we don't have to struggle with that. But even Constantine's mother was already Christianized, and this is like before the year three hundred. Mm -hmm. But Judaism was tolerated as a religion. And why was that? What was the Roman government policy? If you conquer a country and they already have a national religion, you don't fight the religion because it just causes all kinds of trouble. You, you let that re be recognized as a religion. But you don't want new religions popping up here and there because people become firebrands, they become, you know, they get all sorts of worked up because of this new religion and then that brings problems. So, what did Paul have to say about his relationship to Christianity? You remember? Romans 1 verses 14 and 15 give us a clue. I have an obligation to all peoples, to the civilized and to the savage, to the educated and to the ignorant, so then I'm eager to preach the good news to you also who live in Rome. That was what he wrote to them. Well, to save souls should be the life work of every one who professes Christ. We are debtors to the world for the grace given us of God, for the light which has shone upon us, and for, the and for the discovered beauty and power of the truth. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 53. Well, what impact has this study of 13 lessons about the book of Acts had on you? What have we learned from our studies together? Are you encouraged to reach out and try spreading the gospel where you are? What, what, what circumstances prevent the spread of the gospel? What? Hardness of heart. I think the, the confusion that has been created throughout Christianity, look at the fact that there are 30,000 mm. different Christian denominations. Wouldn't that make people's heads spin? Who could be right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, the truth is that there's only really two reasons why the gospel doesn't get spread. Either you don't want to spread it or somebody doesn't want to receive it. One or the other. And, and there's variations of those two ideas, but that's basically it. Um, it's not, Paul demonstrated that no circumstances should be able to stop the spread of the gospel and, and the rest of the apostles, I mean, nothing stopped them until they were finally cut down. Well, if you are too embarrassed or feel you are unprepared to speak on behalf of Jesus Christ, 
What would you say to Paul about your excuses? <laughs> it would be, it'd be a little embarrassing. Uh, there's a story told, uh, obviously an apocryphal story, about a man who lived a, in a terrible flood in the United States and back in the many years. And so um, he, after that, he, he just wanted to tell everybody about the terrible flood he'd lived through. And so according to the story, he, he, goes, he shows up at the pearly gates and Peter says, well, you know, welcome, what, what, what do you want to do? Oh, I want to tell everybody about the flood I lived through. Okay, fine. So I'll, I'll gather some people around here and, and you can tell your story. So he gets all ready and he's always thinking about all the details and how he's going to spell it all. And when everybody had gathered, why, uh, Saint, according to the story, St. Peter says, uh, I th the one thing I think I need to tell you before you start with the story, you see that guy sitting on the front row? So His name is Noah. <laughs> 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 you, know, you, you know, just, well, are you open to opportunities to spread the gospel? Have you, how can you, we keep our eyes and our minds alert to any opportunity that might come our way? Certainly not any of us, none of us have per persevered through difficulties that Paul had. There are only two reasons we've already mentioned why the gospel is not being spread more vigorously. One, our unwillingness to share it, and, and or two, the unwillingness of those to whom we speak to hear it. And of course, there are reasons why we don't share and there's reasons why they don't hear. Paul had the message of the gospel burned into his heart. He could not keep quiet about it. Do you know anyone who has that condition? In fact, three or four places in, in his own writings, Paul says, I'm a slave. What is he trying to say? He's saying, the gospel has burned such a hole in my, my character and my life and my heart that I just have to talk about it. I can't stop talking about it. And the, the, the verses that are translated where Paul says, I'm, I'm a servant, the real word is slave. Do you think Paul ever got discouraged about spreading the gospel? He must have been really dejected by being, been you know rejected by those Jewish Christian Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. While we have talked about Paul's journey, review once again all the times when Paul witnessed for Jesus under very difficult circumstances. And if you get our handouts that are available on our website at theox.org, you can see the whole list of times when Paul witnessed under very difficult circumstances. We know that very difficult times are coming for us. There's the plagues coming. There are the things leading up to the plagues. Are we going to be prepared to do as Paul did and witness to the truth of the gospel even then? Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege we've had to talk about the book of Acts and the wonderful examples that we have from Paul and Peter and uh, others in, in the various roles and stories we've, we've talked about. Forgive us for being reticent to speak up to those that we might associate with or know or live next door to. We wonder what Paul would say to us if he saw us and if he lived here, how he, how he would go about his process of spreading the gospel to others. We thank you for this study of the book of Acts. Be with us as we think about it and continue to meditate on it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.